welcome to my sewing room. I am so excited about what we're going to do today. I have a very dear friend and business colleague of mine who is going to join you with some really wonderful secrets. Joyce Drexler will be my guest. Joyce is the co-managing partner of Sulky of America and author of the book Secrets to Successful Stabilizing. And that is what Joyce is going to share with you today. Now let's just see some of the magnificent things that Joyce has brought to share with you. Some really fabulous techniques. You know, when I look at a dress like this, I can just imagine that this will be in a museum many, many years from now for people to say, oh, look at the wonderful sewing they were doing back in 1999. Isn't that fabulous? Now let me pull up the skirt. It's equally as exciting on the skirt. The strips that are on the bottom kind of with all kinds of stitching over them, those beautiful machine designs done with a beautiful metallic thread. This is so special. Let me just show you. So exciting. This is a vest. Now let me put my hand behind here so you can see. And by the way, purple is one of my very favorite colors. Do you see this wonderful vest with all of the texture? This is a piece of art, as are all of these clothes, of course. You know, that's what sewing is really all about, is making art for today, wearable art. This was used on, done on a heavy stabilizer and then washed away, and that is absolutely magnificent. This is another fun and easy little vest to make, a quilted vest. And on the front are all kinds of, of designs with the, um, the uh, metallic thread and the machine embroidery. And let me just show you on the back. There are some more interesting designs done with double needle and this wonderful metallic thread which gives it such a beautiful and exciting look. The double needle metallic thread work, double needle pin tucks. This is one of my very favorites. Talk about making art. Look at the jewelry piece over here done with the beautiful threads hanging down. There is stippling. And this is probably one of my very, very favorite parts of this vest. There is a netting which is over over these little pieces of fabric which look exactly like the leaves on the tree. And here is some three-dimensional art. Of course, stabilizers are very critical if you're going to create art clothes like these. And coming on down, we have the woven over and under and the stippling and the couching and then the double needle pin tucks over here all done with these fabulous metallic threads. This, these garments are what I call showstoppers. This is absolutely one of my very favorites. Let me just share with you this cute little vest. You know how much I love machine embroidery. So we have machine embroidered spools on here on a fabric which has spools on it. And you see this puffy stuff right here? It looks like uh, padded satin stitch. Well, you can do that if you have the right foam underneath there, a puffy foam and a wonderful stabilizer. Now then, come on along with me and I'm going to ask Joyce to share with you all of the real magic of what's happening today with stabilizers. I'm always asked, Martha, what kind of stabilizer do you use for that? Well, in order to answer those questions for you, I have my very dear friend and business colleague, Joyce Drexler from Sulky of America. And Joyce, I'm so happy you could come to be on the show again this year. It's always so exciting <laughs> to be with you. And I'm going to be going over all these different stabilizers that I hope will answer a lot of questions. Fantastic. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Well, this first piece that we have is a computerized embroidery. And what I wanted to tell the people about that is the fact that you want to use a stabilizer that tears away easily off of the back so you're not tearing away any of the uh, stitching as you tear it off. But one thing about this temporary tear away is the fact that it has a grain line to it and a lot okay. of people don't realize that. You can tear it and it'll tear unevenly in one direction but if you tear it in the other direction you can see it tears in a nice straight line. And in some cases it's very beneficial to line your stabilizer up so it will tear in an even line like that. Joyce, I had no idea yeah, there was and a grain line on what, stabilizer. What's really nice also, it's available in black, so when you do the black 
work, you're not going to have any little white specks showing through. Now, another type of stabilizer that is very much like this, but is heavier, and I don't know if you can really tell that, but you can hear it crinkle Kinda a little stiff. bit. It's yeah. very stiff, and when you're working with something that you need that extra bit of stabilizing, that's when you would use the heavier one. And that's one. a tearaway, too. That stiff that's one is a tearaway. That's okay. also a temporary stabilizer. Okay. Now, I have a piece here that was also embroidered on the machine, but what's interesting is this woven work and the decorative stitches on the sewing machine. When I do work with decorative stitches, uh, that's another time that I would stabilize the back with that tear away that's that temporary. The, okay. the lighter one lighter actually one. would be good for this okay. particular um, type of design. Um, now another stabilizer that we work with that has a real unique um, body to it is called uh, uh, one that heats away with the um, iron. And what you can do is actually... Is that one? Is this beautiful purple this thing This beautiful like piece was oh. all woven and um, it was then all stitched down on this type of heat away type of stabilizer. And you can see that now, this is... Is that what the stabilizer looks like? That this white is piece what of it fabric? Look, it okay. sort of looks okay. like a muslin, doesn't it? It does. And it's got a stiff quality to it with a lot of body, so it's easy to stitch on. But what's going to happen here, Martha, is then after this is all stitched, this is actually all thread here creating a lace. Okay. And when that is all ironed away, what you have left is a beautiful collar oh. of thread. So pretty. Isn't that something? And that's how this, this beautiful drapey scarf was done also, just built on a layer of that heat away heat type away of, kind of thing. stabilizer. Do you use a wet iron or a dry iron? It has that? to be a dry iron. Okay. Make sure you don't okay. add water because that makes the chemical in that stabilizer float around and that could be a problem. So <laughs> okay. we don't we don't add any water. Now something else you can do with that type of stabilizer. Now the heat away is what you're right, talking about. Right, is, is to create dimensional work like this spider web. This was so much fun to do. So cute. And easy to add a wonderful look to one of your holiday designs. Another stabilizer that's um, relatively new is called, um, it's very soft and it's very sheer as you can see here. And what we do with this is to create three dimensional type of embroideries. As you can tell with this, this is a, a, little, a little design that's been having the, the stabilizer actually cut away. But this In other is a, words, that one doesn't tear away at all. This one is a permanent stabilizer. Okay, okay. <clears throat> and what that means is that you cannot tear it off. It has to be cut away or you can use a hot um, iron like you cut stencils with uh -huh. and actually burn it away. Now something that I want to show you here, which is interesting, a lot of us have, have little children and we, we like to embroider these little bibs. The stabilizer that I like to use on the back is um, called uh, it's got a sticky base to it and it peels away with the release sheet. Now something else you can do with that type of stabilizer is actually make your own templates. This is a template. It's very coarse and I can use it over and over again, uh, but it's, it's very nice and thick made with that layers of the sticky stuck together. Okay. Which is kind of interesting. Now, uh, one that we have had for a long time and available to us that is magical is one that washes away, <laughs> and we all have loved that. Over 10 years, we've had this type of stabilizer, and as you can see, it's very flimsy and light, and what we're able to do then is uh, use it as a, as a support when we're doing cut work which is very useful. And Australian window pane and all of those other oh, techniques. Oh, there's so many things you can do with that stabilizer. I just love that wash away too. Now, earlier on the show, you were showing those dimensional trees. Uh -huh. Well, this is another dimensional tree uh, look. And as you can see, it was developed on the stabilizer. All this was stitched on the stabilizer. Now, is that just one layer of the wash away stabilizer? This is actually two layers. Okay. But okay. it also comes in a heavier type of stabilizer, so you don't have to put two layers. You can use the heavier one if you want. It's just kind of supersized. But what I like about this is that it gives you that foundation to work on, but then it will actually wash away when you're done. But you always want to cut away the excess as much as possible. And then when you have that... that Do you just dip it in water to wash it away? You dip it in water and uh, it's submerge so it. And, and lots of times on some pieces you can just spray it and it'll go away, depending on how heavy the stabilizer is. Now those pieces that we pull off, 
we saved those, Martha, and we put those in a jar in the refrigerator with water. How does it's, that work? It's like a, a, a solution of one to one. Uh, and what I do every time I tear off scraps, I put more in the jar and I label it so the teenagers don't drink it thinking it's some kind of drink. <laughs> but with that, with that liquid stabilizer, you can actually brush it on to fabric to make it stiff. Okay. temporarily while you do your decorative stitches. And what's nice it's about that, Martha, it. is it doesn't cause any stress when you go to get rid of the stabilizer. All you do is you throw it in a wash and it washes away. That's fast. I've heard people talk about making their little water-soluble scraps and mixing it with water. So a one-to-one -one formula is what one you to use. One-to-one formula. Okay. Now another stabilizer... That's good ecology too, using it again. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Another stabilizer um, that can be used several ways is uh, one that is ironed on. Now this is a beautiful quilt by oh, Libby Lehman. I know oh, you've yeah. heard of her, but this beautiful ribbon type design that you see here, it beautiful. it's all Metallic made out of threads. thread. Mm. But to get the pattern onto the top of this quilted base, you actually trace your design onto an iron-on stabilizer, iron it on top of the fabric, the pattern. the pattern, and then you're able to create these rows as a pattern to follow. So sometimes stabilizers go on top Sometimes they go underneath as a support. You know, Joyce, I am so happy that you have told us about these different stabilizers. It is so critical. Now, what about that shirt you have on? What kind of stabilizer this is, did you use this, for that wonderful design? You Sailing. That, that's kind of like Florida, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's, it's <laughs> everywhere. everywhere. Any coast. Everywhere. Any coast. <laughs> but what I like about the, the, uh, the shirt is the fact that sometimes we're working on knits mm -hmm. and we need extra stabilization for those types of things. So I might combine a sticky product and some of the tearaway product together to give the support that I need. Especially on knits. Especially See, on you knits. can really embroider on anything, can't you? Can you can embroider on anything. As long as you, you have get the right that. stabilizer. That's right, the right stabilizer. <laughs> Joyce, thank you so much for joining it's me. It's been a pleasure. And now I have a home decorating project for you. I just love this pillow. We have done it and it's a puffing pillow, kind of a very large puffing pillow. We have done it in shades of pink with the beautiful machine embroidery in the center. And by the way, this little trim around here is simply purchase trim. Now this is what you call gigantic puffing and it would be magnificent done out of the more traditional decorator fabrics, even a sort of a lightweight upholstery or a silk dupioni and ecrus or any colors to go with any any uh, room in your house. Now it's really pretty simple to do. Now let me say this, when I'm going to do, I need to line it, when I'm using lightweight fabrics I'm going to line it. So I'm going to put a little temporary spray adhesive in here and so I kind of glue it together just a little bit temporarily then I'm ready to do my embroidery in the middle. Now I'm going to make puffing a wide piece of puffing. Now normally I do not make it this wide. I've used my gathering foot, zip down one side, zip down the other, and then I'm going to line it, or rather sew it, well line it also to a straight piece of fabric. So I have stitched the puffing down where it's not going to really go anywhere because it's already lined. Then the next step is to take my embroidered piece, which you can see here, and to take my long piece of lined puffing and simply go around and pin it. Go all the way around and pin it and then to sew it. I also have one more piece on the back. I will sew this piece as you can see to the front and the piece that I just um, kind of sprayed together here, I have another piece to go on the back and then I have finished this absolutely beautiful pillow. Here is the front and let me turn it over and show you the back. The back has the flat part just like the front did. And next, I have some fine baby wear techniques for you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, my dear friend and business colleague, Claudia Newton. Claudia is the editorial director of the Fancy Works section of So Beautiful magazine and has recently finished a year's course at the Japanese School of Embroidery. Claudia, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. We're going to talk about sewing on fine baby wear again today. And what we're going to talk specifically about are these tiny bias bindings and the shell edging on the hem. You can see here that we have little eighth inch bindings, very small, and this little delicate shell edging that's been put on by hand. 
the first thing I'd like to mention to you is that when you start to put on a neck binding, I'm going to turn in the placket and put on my buttonholes first. That means that my top buttonhole can be very close to my turned under binding. So after I've done that, and remember to stabilize your buttonholes on this fine weight fabric, once I've done that, I sew the binding on. But first you need to know about cutting it. For a one inch binding, I would cut it one inch wide, fold it in half, and when I stitch it with a quarter inch seam, I'll trim it to an eighth, and when I turn that to the inside, I wind up with an eighth of an inch finished, which is what I want on these tiny baby things. We're not going to go through those steps because most people know how to do that or it's written in your pattern instructions. I want to give you some tips today on making it easier and making them tiny. Once you sew it on, if you'll notice, my neck edge is still curved. I've sewn it on in a curve because if you straighten the neck edge out, it will stretch. So you want to leave it in a curve as you sew it. I've sewn on the quarter inch seam line, and then I come back with a tiny little zigzag stitch that you can probably see there that's about an eighth of an inch wide. When I trim my seam allowance to an eighth of an inch, it's the same width that my finished binding is. That's so that when I turn it to the inside, it completely stuffs my binding. And you can see how flat and how tightly this is stuffed. That's what makes it neat and tiny, and it'll keep it from waffling and rippling on the outside. Now, when we do something like our um, sleeve bands or the armhole of a little gown like this, you run into a little bit of a problem because we want to put a French seam in there. If you'll look at this, I've already done the first stitching on the French seam here. Then I turn it to the inside, and I'm ready to make my second stitching. This is a little bit bulky here because I'm going to have a French seam as well as my binding seam. So let me show you real quick what I do about that. When we go to the sewing machine, I have a starter square back here that's been folded and I have stitched partly through it, Martha, There's so that I'm of almost then. at the edge. Okay. Okay. That raises the level of my presser foot so that when I put this under here and it's a little bit thick, it doesn't have to go over a hump. It's already at the same level. So I slide this up, and um, if you've done French seams this way before, we do them with a pin tuck foot so that it's very tiny, and it will roll that seam through the edge of the foot. So when I start to stitch, if you see that the seam wants to fold towards you, raise the foot, stick it back under there with your stick, and if you'll guide it through with the stick, you'll go through, and I'm not getting it quite over there, if you raise it, it'll guide it through for you. And you may have to do that several times, even with the hump jumper thing, because it's just a little bit bulky. But once I've got it in there and it's very narrow, you'll see that it finishes feeding just fine now. Well, when that is finished, let me show you another sample here. When that's finished, it's just like any other French seam. I press it very, very flat. And then I put in the first part of my French seam, then I come back and I do the second part of my French seam, and that leaves it small enough that I can still fold it to the inside and turn it under and whip it. So it will come under very tiny for you. Now, the last thing that I want to go over, and this is so simple, we're going to do it quickly. I've pressed up a hem. It can be anywhere from an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch double hem. The easy way to make these shells even is to use this little tape that's been marked with hash marks. Decide how far apart you want your stitches to be, and these little marks are going to be your guide. Once you're folded in place, you'll come through the fold of the fabric, and I'm using big thread so you can see. I've come through just the fold, not my actual shirt. I wrap it around, and I come under the fold, and let me see where I can see it and then I'll show it to you. There, so that it comes out in the fabric this time just under the fold at one of those little hash marks. This is wrapped around, well I've lost it. There it goes. It's wrapped around, and I'll pull it down against it, but I don't pull it tight. This way. I wrap it one more time, come out in that same little hole, and this time, I am going to wrap it tight, but I put my thumb on it first. 
so that when I pull it, I get that little dimple in there. The next thing I do is to go back through the fold of the fabric, come out where I want my next stitch to be, right there, and I begin the wrapping process again so that I wrap and pull all the way across. That's what Claudia, makes the that's dimple. fascinating. Thank you. And next, I have a craft for you. This is one of my favorite crafts we've ever had. It's called Pots and Pins. The first little pot, and by the way, these are just little flower pots, has a little rub-on stencil on the front, and then this is really meant to be just a little pin cushion here. And wouldn't that be sweet for anybody's sewing room, or for that matter, in the den where you sew? Now this one is really one of my favorites. It's a little topiary tree that has some moss glued on. And you know what we put on there, the kind of pins? We put the little pins that we have made for people, especially when they come to the Martha Pullen School of Art Fashion. I'll turn it all the way around for you, but it would also be nice just to put some costume jewelry on. Wouldn't these be pretty in your dressing room also? Now for the first little pot, just get a little plain pot at the craft store. This is a rub off uh, stencil. So you just simply pull off the front, put it on the pot. See if I can stabilize it here and you rub it off with a popsicle stick. Now, I'm not going to take the whole time to do that, but that's step number one. And then you're going to cut a circle and put some of this nice plastic canvas, cut a circle, and cut a circle, gather your circle up with your plastic canvas with a hole in the middle there. S take your stuffing, stuff it in, and then I'm going to sew it up, just to do a few little running stitches to make sure the stuffing doesn't pop out and then I will simply glue it into my little flower pot and put a little ribbon around it. Now the other one is really quite easy to make too. You can purchase one of these little topiary uh, pots and tops. You can see the little green foam is underneath there. And then this one was simply covered with a pretty pink velveteen and just glued down and then all the different trims. There's a little bit of a, just a braid around here after you get it all glued down, and you know where else this braid, just take it around the top and just make a little hat for that little tree. Pin it down, and then, so, oh, so many pretty ribbons you can get now. This little silky one run, that has the little gathering threads in the end, kind of like little wires. See, you can just pull those little wires up and gather it and gather it and make it as full or not as full as you want to. And then you glue on some of this moss, also gotten at the craft store. And then you just get this little, it's kind of like ribbon puffing to tell you the truth. So you just gather it around and do a little glue at the top and a little glue at the bottom. And then you have a really pretty little tree to put any kind of pins you want to. This is really reminiscent for me uh, because we've been doing these little pins for so many years at our school in Huntsville. Isn't that a nice place to put? And a lot of quilters, by the way, collect those little sewing pins too. And now, won't you join me in my attic? This is a magnificent combing coat, very Victorian and very beautiful. The collar has the prettiest piece of wide lace you've ever seen stitched around. And I'm going to, uh, just so you can see the magnificent work on the rest of this bodice, I'm going to fold the collar under. One, two, three, four, five beautiful tucks go down the side, as well as this beautiful, absolutely magnificent hand embroidery with the padded satin stitch and the little seed stitches. And then look at the beautiful tucks on the center of this combing coat. I'm going to pull over the sleeve too. Look at the magnificent embroidery all done by hand and the pretty lace on the bottom of the sleeve and the lace goes all the way down around the bottom. You know, we've always talked about, or we've talked about a lot, that the backs of these Victorian pieces were just as pretty as the front. So I'm going to turn this around and let you see this pretty sailor type collar on the back and the tucks that go in sets of two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, down the back and that wonderful little strip that holds in the fullness. They didn't just tuck in their blouses then, they used strips to hold in the fullness so the tucks would not go anywhere. Something else very interesting about this blouse is that the sleeves, the fullness in the sleeves have been gathered in with little pleats instead of gathers the way that a sleeve is usually gathered in. Quite an interesting blouse for a lady to wear, kind of as a dressing jacket. 
Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I've loved having you here. And I would like to issue a special invitation for you to come back next time.